There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Welcome to another Word in Your Attic, where very excitingly we are joined in New York by the novelist, uh, singer, songwriter, music writer, producer, former record label boss, and the man who is responsible for making uh, one of our favourite ever Christmas singles, more of which later. Fantastic yeah, to see him, the great David Sigerson. David, how are you? Okay. Very well. So happy to be with you, gentlemen. Good. And New York, how has New York been during this, um, this unpleasantness? Oh, every which way. <laughs> you know, right. All of the all of the above. All of uh, the above. Fine. I mean, in there, and uh, you know, sometimes, as I think London probably was resplendent with bursts of hope, and then slightly tamped down again. But but people are getting used to the whole the whole idea of it. Right. Precisely. That this Precisely. is just you know, this is our our rolling mountain ride for the foreseeable future. Yep. Well, okay. And you've lived there. You were you were born there, weren't you? But moved to England. I can't remember how old you were. About thirteen or something. Yes, exactly. I was born in New York. I moved to London when I was thirteen. Um, I thought I was happy about it, but I wasn't. I was in the middle of what's called eighth grade here. So then the next year, I was at age fourteen. Was my it was a long story, but it became my O level year. Yeah, which was a, really formative and good for me, but. Um, uh, all of the fun was really going off in America. So I'd go back and see my friends and all, all the girls that uh, didn't seem interested seemed in interested, not in me, just generally interested. And um, uh, the song that got me through it, and I would listen to it every night and stare at my ceiling, because that is what we're here to talk about. It was uh, Van Morrison Street Choir. Why did you right. leave yeah. America? Why did you leave America, of course? And things that seem so better off. Why yeah. did you come around? I mean, it was not, you know, it was not spot on, but it was awfully close. And my eyes would fill with tears and I would bond with Van and <laughs> lament my fate. But it was all, it was all fine. It was all better. So so well, where we you, start with yeah, New on, York, yeah, we should, yeah. shouldn't we? Really? I mean, it, 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 can you remember the the record playing equipment in your home at the time when you were very young? And what was on yeah, it? Yeah, it was. Um, would it have been like a Technics turntable? Right, okay. Yeah, days and a good amp, a decent amp, you know, like a kid sized amp and speakers in my bedroom. <clears throat> my parents had good sound in the living room, where I would go and play stuff, and there was obviously a cassette player around for for other purposes, but you know, it was a vinyl world. I have a thing to say about this whole show and tell thing you guys like to do and yeah. vinyl, which is I am not a fetishist. No, no. Um, at all, uh, not for the objects, you know, I, what I, I care about what's what's in the grooves, not, not yeah. the, the object that con contains it. And I, just a one little rage, rave editorial for a second. When people talk about vinyl, and I love vinyl, and I have a turntable and I listen to it and I play it, not preferentially, but there are a lot, there's a lot of stuff they only have on vinyl. Um, they think of it as some kind of pure thing. And it's completely, unless you're listening to a direct disc, you know, the lathe goes from the microphone recording, there's nothing pure about it. And most of those recordings are bad because they're made for, for audiophiles who have no taste. Um, it's for, it, but this, but this, the signal path, um, if you've gone through, um, listen, if you buy a record it used to be certainly in any country that wasn't source, even if you bought an English record pressed in France, they would send a 15 Ips Dolby copy of the master tape over and then make the records from that. And so there was more tape hiss. Sometimes it was two gener. It was Mexico. It was like could be three generations down because people didn't care. And you're only as good as the medium. So when people rave on to me about vinyl, and I love how vinyl sounds, I say think of it not as a. Uh, uh, it's not like some piece of 
rare fruit. It's more like a condiment. It's more like HP sauce. It's putting this not very nice kind of softening glop on top of whatever third generation tape or harsh digital source. It was like early Steely Dan records. You know, it's not something pure. It's something um, uh, of, of its own that adds to it. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, people still use tape to record drums because the sound of tape compression on a snare drum is what we think of as being part of rock and roll. Um, so it's fine, but just know it for what it is. It's a condiment. Yeah, yeah. When you came to England, where were you living in England? We lived um, at a few friends' places at, at first. It sounds very down and out in Dickensian. I have to confess it was not at all. They were extremely nice places, and the friends were like living in France for a year or something. And then we moved into an apartment right behind the Chelsea Town Hall. Oh, right. Okay. Um, which was also very kind of modern and had great views and, and it was a great place for throwing parties. So I lived there. I went to school, did O-levels, A-levels, went to university in England. So I was there from the ages of 13 to 21, I think I finally left. Did you haunt the record shops of the King's Road back in those days? I went to the one a lot in um, at Chelsea Drugstore on Royal Avenue because oh, right. the place we lived was on Royal Avenue in one of those nice houses. Um, right. And um, But I haunted um, like Contempo Records in, uh, you know, to, to go and hear when all the soul singles came, came in on, you know, Saturday afternoon or whatever. And um, so, yeah, I went to a lot of different, record stores i love record stores it was um the best see, see you're a particular fan of uh, of uh, soul as you say black american music from an early yeah. age yeah i mean i came up um i came up in a pretty normal uh you know through uh dylan and beatles and the stones um i've never been biologically as much of a beatles person although a huge fan but very much still a stones person um <laughs> Still have the postcards. Oh, really? Oh, nice. you still got the postcards. Yeah, that's good. Wow. <laughs> still have the postcards. Oh, um, but I'm not a fan. I'm not a. I. I never play this. I mean, it's been remastered and sounds better. So I play. I play the digital improved version. But, um, and then I had a friend who was a blues guitarist, uh, who turned me on to all that stuff. But I particularly fell for Little Walter. Um, and um, so I went through a blues phase. That was a pretty natural progression. <clears throat> um, Sly was a huge, is a huge god to me. And um, but th all through the weeds of 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 contemporary at the time black music, and then going back and now going forwards. So yeah, I was a soul boy, but I never stopped liking everything else. But that was and probably still is you know when i'm most that well and some jazz you know but yeah it's like i mean there's some great i mean i i other than like i guess what would be called easy listening or mor or whatever there's not really a genre that um i don't have things that i love passionately in including country i mean a lot of great country when i'm in my car um driving around it's almost exclusively old country that i listen to because i don't know the songs are short and they all have something to say. Right. When did you start writing about music? I mean, you, you, you were a teenager, weren't you, I think? Yeah, I was, the, I got a, um, uh, I started getting Black Music Magazine and loving it and reading it from cover to cover. And they would always refer to chugging keyboards or burbling synths or something. I was making music at the time. And, um, I thought, well, these things you know, these are actual things. They have names. They're clavinets, they're arps, they're, you know, whatever they are, and they work in certain ways. So um, I think I called, I don't think I just wrote it and said, would you like a piece explaining keyboards and referencing them to the records right. uh, that we, you know, we're all listening to? And they said, yeah, sure, try it. So I wrote it and they took it and then we met. And um, um, I remember going to the office thing. Jeff Brown was the editor then. Okay, was, I was just yeah, going to say, yeah. yes, go on, Jeff Brown, so, yes. And then Tony Cummings, who was a great, great mentor and brilliant writer, and Carl Gale, who was the best at the magazine, I thought, overall. But I remember coming with my brother, who was a part-time prize fighter, 
And Jeff had an office with like <laughs> a glass window. That breaks the ice at parties. <laughs> glass window uh, between his office and the rest of the room. It was all down at IPC across the river. And it was like one big room that was black music. And um, there was a turntable in, in the office, uh, the, the main office. And so I went in to see Jeff. Uh, this was after I'd been writing there for several months. And I said, you see, the, th the thing is, I haven't gotten any checks from you people. Um, they said, oh, well, I'm sure it's in process. And I said, yeah, no, I'm sure, I'm sure it is. Let me just point out, my, my, my brother is a fairly <laughs> violent man. And, and he's going to destroy your, your, your stereo system if I rate, when I raise my hand. And he looked over and kind of nodded and smiled. Um, so uh, I'd like that to be in process now, please. So you don't have to replace your stereo. And he thought it was funny and good. And I th actually, I think made a phone call and things sorted out. But and kept commissioning you amazingly. Yeah, that's good. Kept commissioning. And um, I did have a problem when I was at Sounds Magazine once we were all, because <clears throat> I'd moved on and started writing there about other stuff. And I was still in my teens. And um, a bunch of writers were having a drink at the pub and talking about stuff. And somehow I got the idea from them that you got paid for writing album reviews, that the payment wasn't just the record, but without the sleeve, because they had to take that for the, for the photography. And I was like, wait, you guys get paid to write the album reviews? The payment isn't the, the record? The free record. <laughs> yeah, and if it was bad, you couldn't take it to Cheapo Cheapo and get uh, money for it if it was just the record without the sleeve so that was even awkward but so that was another moment where I stormed into an editor's office and said look you really have to pay me I mean, <laughs> who, were, who were the who was at sound at that time it was the editor was it Alan Smith not Alan Smith well Alan it's Lewis Alan, well, Alan Lewis I you know I don't I really don't right know. okay okay but you ended up exactly. you ended up at the you, melody maker didn't you I did, and 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 and, and, and a great uh, mentor of mine and friend is Richard Williams. Right. Who okay. um, uh, I can't remember how I found him. I think he saw my writing in Black Music, and when I moved back after university to New York, I moved back as the East Coast uh, columnist for Melody Maker. Oh, I was saying right. among other things, which was a fantastic gig. Um, I mean, having a column is great. It's fun. It's messy, um, and you can really, you know, champion things that that you love. And so I had my half a page every episode, and I wrote other stuff for them. And I saw two of your uh, old colleagues just the other day, Ian Birch and, and Michael Watts, and they were saying that they remember the times you came into the office that you used to type standing up with the typewriter on top of a of a filing cabinet, which is very know. impressive. I mean, not many people. I mean, Dickens used to type standing up. I think at Hemingway. I'm impressed by this. I I don't remember that, but um, I'm I, 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 I'm sure it's true. And when I would do essays uh, for f like school essays, I would have the the typewriter up quite high also because I'd have music blasting and I would kind of dance around the room, yeah. and come up and like type a paragraph. Ooh, inspiration. Sometimes I'd have to yeah. sit down, but mostly, I, yeah. So yeah, that sounds plausible. So this was late seventies, was this uh, when you arrived? I graduated in seventy eight, I think. Stuck around for about a year. I had I got a, a record deal with a label on phonogram called Fresh Air, a lovely man named Tony Hall, who signed oh, me. Tony Hall, what the, the English Tony Hall? Oh, the plug, the song plugger, and he had right, this, who died last year, didn't he? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. The great Ten Hall, indeed. Yeah, the wonderful man who involved with Black Sabbath and I mean all sorts of odd things, but also loved soul and he had the real thing. It's his big, yeah. I think, success as a as a label or or a manager. I guess they were on Pi. Um, but um, it was a slightly long story. But anyway, so he found me. Uh, my parents for my 16th birthday gave me 15 pound, 50, 50 pounds, and said, "Do something musical and get it out of your system." <laughs> so I, I did a, a song demo with kids from school and the school guitar teacher who I dragged into the ugliness of it all. And um, we did a demo. And then I was with my uh, a friend at the time who understood all this stuff. She was in a dance group called The Young Generation. Oh, right. Okay. With them. 
So okay. we were, were hanging out, which was nice. And um, uh, I saw a table. I was there to see Ann Peebles upstairs at the Biba Rainbow Room. And I loved mm -hmm. Ann Peebles. Right. And I think other, I, I think I already might have had some journalist friends at that point. We're like, well, we're going to see the Damned. And it's like, oh, please, I'm going to see Ann Peebles. <laughs> and um, not a, neither was it would have been a bad choice, really. And um, uh, <clears throat> I saw a table full of people that included David Bowie and Ian Hunter and a guy named Greg Edwards, who, had a, who was the head of r and promotion for, for CBS and did all the Philly sound stuff and also had a radio show on Capitol Radio called Soul Spectrum. And so I said, OK, if I don't come back, you know, I'll talk to you tomorrow. And I left the table because I saw Greg go to the men's room. And then I planted myself between the table and Greg. And I said, can I play you a tape? Uh, and we found ourselves across the street. And I think it was called the Great American's Disaster, Great American Success. One was the ripoff of the other. One was in Fulham. Road. This was the one across Ken High Street. And, and um, then we found ourselves at like 1 in the morning, 1.30 in the morning on a school night. Um, I had... Uh, I don't think I had actually turned 16 yet. I think I'd made the demo in the living room at my parents' house. Uh, and my mother comes in because she hears fairly loud music playing. And there I am sitting with a very elegant um, uh, Guyanese American gentleman who was Greg Edwards. Um, no, I don't think he was. I think he was from St. Vincent, maybe, not Guyanese. And um, she says, oh, you, you have guests. I didn't realize and walked out, which was like, Major cool mother points. <laughs> yes. Um, he said, well, no, it's good. I'll, I'll put you on the radio and we'll see what happens. So I became kind of a regular guest on Soul Spectrum for oh, about really? a month or two. And we stayed really good friends. Fantastic. And labels yeah. called. And I said, yeah, but I, I, I have to finish my schooling. That's part of the deal. And I have to produce myself. So only Tony was stupid enough to let that happen, um, which was lo lovely and fortunate that he lost his deal, so that music has never been heard, which would be pretty embarrassing. It was really awful. <laughs> um, so um, the journalism and the music, the making of music have gone together. I mean, they still, I mean, I don't, I don't I do music still, but um, writing about, you know, words and music have always been what I, what I care about most and what I, what I do. And one sometimes supported the other, or one was the hobby and one was the, the breadwinner, but they always kind of moved together. So. so this, this that I have in my hand. You have in your hand, yeah. This is 1980, isn't it? Is that right? So that's not long after this. No, I think it's 1980. Um, I moved back to New York. Uh, Charlie Gillett was, ma was managing me. Oh, the really? Wonderful Charlie. Yeah. And, and uh, we did a demo. Um, for Muff Winwood at CBS and he passed. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I don't need to be here for, for doing this. I think it's fair. So I went back to New York uh, with the column for Melody Maker and my best friend was the DJ at the, the infamous famous Mud Club. So through being in that world, I got signed by the wonderful Michael Zilka to Z Records, and that was how that came out, and that began my long. Well, end. we remember that label very, very fondly, and it was—it seemed to us like a kind of a face magazine concept in a way. You know, it was Christina and James White and the Blacks and Kid Creole, and I mean, whether or not it ever made any money, it was certainly fabulous to look at. A fabulous. It, it did make money in places because Kid Creole made. Money. Kid Creole okay, sold yeah. a lot of records, yeah. yeah, one or two, and in the end, was not was made made money. Um, yeah. Um, I certainly did not make them any money. I did, I did, we did two albums that came out and um, I'm actually putting up a bunch of old demos and some of the tracks that didn't came up, come, came out onto the interwebs eventually this year because it's nice stuff. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, but, but it was a lot of fun and he was fun. And then Blackwell was, was a lot of fun. I had, I think, four or five different contracts with Chris over a two or three year period. He, we would fight, he would drop me, he would sign me again. We would fight, he would drop me, he would sign me again. Um, but I love Chris. Chris, I mean, what a what a force for good in music. So and there's, there's a song on this first album, which I must just uh, spotlight, called I Never Fall In Love, which I play every every year. It's quite it's 20 years since, yeah. 40 years since, you know. <laughs> 
And uh, has that had any kind of afterlife, that song? Because a lot of people talk about that song. It Well, it was in a Brazilian telenovela called Plumas e Paietes, Plumes and Serpents, which was the, the inner story of the inner workings of the Brazilian high fashion industry. Um, you know, they have those shows. It was on Globo, which is the big network there. And that became like the big song from that series. So I actually spent a week in Brazil. I was on the show um, at this like pivotal party scene, uh, lip syncing. And I had a week of being a pop star. Right. Um, one week, exactly, seven days. Um, uh, and um, it was a great experience. It was not, I realized it was like not for me. Didn't care enough. I mean, why, always, why was it not for you? Well, I always had a, I, I was, I, you know, this is, this is like a, a silly thing for anyone to complain about. And I'm not complaining about it. But um, I was reasonably well raised with reasonably good self esteem. And one of the general rules that I had, both as a, in the, in the, in the record business, it was definitely a rule that never hire a promotion guy with good self esteem. Um, you know, they have it's 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 Willie Loman. They have to have that motivation of always needing to prove that they're okay. And I think that with artists, um, and actually, there's a very good Edmund Wilson essay about this. And I think the wound in the bow. Um, if you've been listened to, it's a real detriment because you expect to be listened to and expect to be heard. And one of the really vital qualities of any great artist is the feeling that they must be heard and they will be heard and they're going to grab you by the lapels and make you listen to them. And I was like, oh, I don't really care what you think. I, you know, <laughs> I've been well listened to. I actually care more about my own opinion. So complete disqualification. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I realized that, that being actually a, a, a pop star for a week on that album cover, the Brazilian promotion guy uh, colored my eyes in blue. <laughs> and the slogan was new blue eyes because the song was a bit of a croon i mean not, not a not a pleasant croon i will i will i will say but a, a croon that song but anyway so that song is still i think gets like youtube hits and i make a little bit of ass cap from it from well Brazil. that's that's good by rightly the well, other, the other song that Ma referred to yeah. earlier uh, you know is the thing that we get out at christmas every year and we always we love it this, this is the second best Christmas record ever made, you know, because you can supply the first on your own. You know what I mean? Which is, it's a big country, and every time we make a bit of a fuss about it, and it always picks up a few people going, it does. that's amazing. <laughs> that's fabulous. Tell it's us the story of that. Well, I first, I mean, it's a really good song. I, being a songwriter, um, you know, Christmas songs are one of those things that you write because they're fun. You think maybe I'll hit one and and get to buy a house or something, but they're just fun. They're fun to write. And I have all these titles. Um, a publisher once said, why don't you write a Christmas a, a country song? I'll get it cut if you write it, but I don't know, whatever I'm called Santa's in the bottle. And the first line was, was um, Santa's in the parking lot. He's looking for his sleigh. Like that Santa's just blind, drunk and blotto and won't be able to get out and get the toys to the boys and girls. Yeah. Um, I should write that. That's a that's a good Christmas country Christmas song. In any case, um, Michael said he was doing a Christmas album with all the Z people, and um, uh, I. It's all absolutely true. Anne was my girlfriend at the time. It, the chorus says, "It's a big country. Merry Christmas, everybody." Just a word for me and Anne. So you've got an aunt who lived out in Oklahoma, or it was, and baked a father grew up in the Hole in Oklahoma, yeah. and Bootsy did live in Oklahoma. And I and my my first cousins on my father's side were running were, did have a sheep farm in Bozeman, Montana. It was just it was all interesting enough. And uh, it's it's your uncle calling Angel. Can you put your mom on the phone? I mean, it's a really well well written song, I must say. But it came out very quickly, and it was just I, I thought I'd like this to be my perennial Christmas card to my family, and that should work for a lot of other people, you know, in in the universal is in the specific. So I just trusted with the specific. Um, good touch. And so how do you how do you end up in uh, working on the kind of executive side in record companies? Um, well, there, there, there was the emotional answer, which was I'd had a real heartbreak with Tori Amos, 
Um, Because you were producing her, weren't you? Yeah, my my production career really took off and um, I was had a bunch of nice things happen and everyone seemed to want me to work for them. And um, uh, Jimmy Iovine once said, just be careful, Dabbit, you know, when you're a producer, just remember you are what you eat. And um, I think that's really true. And my advice to anyone producing records is pick the right artist um, and make sure the song is cut in the right key for their voice at the right tempo. And everything else is optional. You know, everything else are style points. But if you get any of those things wrong, the wrong artist, oh, the wrong song, that's the other one. You know, the wrong artist, the wrong song, the right, the wrong tempo or the wrong key, you don't have much chance of success and everything will work out fine if you get that stuff right. So um, uh, we made a record for Atlantic, Little Earthquakes, and Atlantic hated it. And um, uh, Doug Morris said it's a fucking $200,000 piano demo. I was going to have Arif Martin put drum machines and synths over everything and try and, and salvage it. And um, Tori was but like- you'd resisted, hadn't you? And she'd resisted. Yeah. She resisted. I, I was, I was livid, but it's not going to mess up my life. It was going to mess up her life. I didn't yeah. have the right to opine. But she, she resisted and sent her to England and everyone in the English record company flipped out. And all you have to do is, that was just what happened when I met her. I heard her play up in her little apartment. And I was just like, I remember driving with my wife um, in California the evening of the day I met her and said, she, so how was the meeting? I said, well, I met this person in this scruffy little apartment next to a church in Hollywood. And I truly believe that little girls are gonna take up piano because of her. They're gonna hear this and say, I wanna do that too, which is of course exactly what happened with Tori, who's an amazing musician, an amazing person, an amazing songwriter. And so I just tried to make a record that stayed out of her way, but that subtly supported um, the emotions of what were in the songs. And we recorded the whole thing. I started by recording her solo voice and piano for two weeks, and we built the rest of the record around that. For one or two tracks and Crucify, we actually cut the rhythm section live with her on, on the session, but most of it was built up that way. And then the record came out, it was a big, success so did the people who, who told you that was a bad idea did they ever concede that you were right did you yeah. see them again yeah i actually was just thinking about the story the other day i was telling it to someone um and you probably heard it um which was that um uh, uh i was at a benefit i was already at, at, at polydor at the time and doug morris walked across this giant banquet room and he came up and he shook my hand and he said david i was so wrong you were so right um which was lovely of him I mean, he was just using his ears and his judgment to do what he thought best, but but uh, it, it was it was great, and it sort of made me feel um, I need to be there longer. I can't just make the record and walk away and hope 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 for the best. If there if I really care about the artist and I don't want to work on anything where I don't really care about the artist, I think the only bad records I made were a couple of records I made where I liked the people so much, didn't love their music. And I think that they were really ill served by me for making that choice. But um, uh, I needed to be around. And so the way to be around was to be at, the, at a record company and you could then protect the- And you were where? You were at EMI, weren't you? I started as my, my first job with a pay stub was Polydor. I think I was 32 or maybe just 33. So my first gig was president of Polydor, which was in the US was not quite as grand as it sounds because it was part of a bigger thing that didn't have its own promotion. I'm trying to think who would have been signed to Polydor at the time. Would that be well, Gwen there Stefani? Were 20, or? There, were, there were 22 or 23 acts that were signed to the US Polydor. And my first thing I did was to drop them all. Um, because I just didn't like their music. And I, they would come in and see me and like, well, what does it mean? It's like, well, I, I, I don't love what you're doing and you deserve to be loved. This is the most important thing in your life. That's a great argument. <laughs> but it's, it's true. And then I had a fight with business affairs because I said, and we're going to give everyone their masters back oh. uh, and get an override. And they were like, well, you, that's not what we do. And I talked to my boss, who was this guy, Alan Levy, a lovely guy who was the head of Polygram globally who hired me. And I said, 
I can't, no one can give me an example of where, I mean, I said, well, what happened with Blue Angel, which was Cindy Lauper's group. I said, well, when she sold whatever it was, 9 million copies, what happened? And they looked, they said, well, not really a blip. I mean, another 20,000 units or something. I said, well, there you go. They can sit in our vault forever and we can own it. Or you can let people walk away with it and get an override. And if something happens, at least you have them working for the record. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I wasn't being altruistic. It made business sense, but it was also the decent thing to do. So that was, it was nice to be able to, to um, give people their music back, even if they were upset. And then I started signing a few things. And, um, but we had a great catalog. I mean, he put me in a great position because we had Andrew Lloyd Webber, we had the Bee Gees, we had Eric Clapton. So uh-huh. the, the, the ink was like ebony, shiny black, no matter what I did or didn't do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no credit to me. So, um, so it's interesting, yeah, uh, because people often, people who don't know the music business at all, always talk about the suits as if the, as if the people who kind of run record labels don't care about music at all. In my experience, lots of them really do. Is, is that fair to say? I think they. I think a lot of them really do. I think there's other things that get in the way of that love, like, um, I mean, I remember my first time being in a meeting with, with a bunch of suits and my boss. Uh, and again, came home and reported to my, to, to my wife. And I said, I was in a room full of grown people. I mean, not like me grown. I mean, grown with like kids in high school and mortgages and they drive in from New Jersey grown, you know, uh, uh, and literally in, in suits. And I looked around this room and I saw all these grown men with fear in their eyes. And I'd say, I am not going to be that person. I am just not going to have fear in my eyes. That's crazy. You know. Well, the majority are plagued by the idea that if they make a wrong decision and sign the wrong act, that their job's on the line, presumably. I, I, no, listen, I respect it. I, I get it. Yeah. I'm, I never, I mean, I mean, I never um, wanted to own a property with a mortgage until I could afford it because I always wanted to be able to walk away. And I mean, the fear is justified. I'm not judging those people. I'm just saying I didn't want to put myself in the position of being that. I didn't like the idea of that at, at all. Um, but I understood it from their point of view. And I felt you have to be ready to walk away. You have to be make, make the decision. There was an old Capitol Records uh, A&R guy named Frank Slay. And this was quoted to me by another of my great mentors, a guy named Carter, who was the guy who signed Tina Turner to Capitol. Yeah, yeah. And the, he wrote Incense and Peppermints when he was 17, I think. Uh, an illustrious career. And Carter said, well, here's the thing that Frank Slay says. In a r it's not about how often you're wrong, it's about how often you're right. Mm. And that's the whole, that's the whole story. It's, it's, you have to take chances and people are not remembered for their, yeah. for their failures. And, you know, it was always, I f- always felt it was very, um, I could honestly say to people, if I didn't, if I like when the art acts that I dropped or acts that I passed on, it's like, I don't get it. You deserve someone who's passionate for, for your music. And that's not me. And a lot of things went on to do well. I mean, I really kick myself over some of, I mean, I, I was one of my very closest friends, Brian Koppelman, who has the TV show billions. And um, he was involved. My second gig was as the president and CEO of EMI, Chrysalis, and SBK in America, which was then I had like the full reins. Um, um, spent half of a year trying to persuade me to produce Tracy Chat. And I didn't, I said, no, the whole thing, you know, if, you know, SBK Records with a, I mean, they were the publisher, you know, doing this sincere singer songwriter just feels kind of cod to me. and. I love her voice because I love Joan Armour trading. It kind of reminds me of that vibe. The A&R guy who signed her to Electra, I was having breakfast with him and I got, we were in a, his car and he was a terrible stare and he said, oh, you should want to hear it. He said, I'd love to hear what you came up with. He put the tape on and Fast Car started playing. And at the very, I mean, already I was seething when I just heard the intro. <laughs> and she started to sing, I lost it. And I didn't realize it. But I, I started hitting him. I was just, <laughs> just like, <This> extreme. <laughs> yeah. um, 
because I knew immediately, but you know, that song, I mean, my excuse, my lame excuse is that that song had not been written at that time, but that is the job. You're supposed to be able to spot the talent um, who might write that song. And so, you know, I, that was a very costly miss. Right. Pretty what were much. your great, what were your great moments as a record exec? Like you look back and think that was the day or that was the, you know, it was the, that was the right decision. Two that come to mind. One was very small and it, easy was um, that the, the great team uh, at, um, at Polygram were doing all the James Brown reissues. And uh, he's an absolute hero of mine and I know the music intimately. And so the all time, 20 all time greatest hits is basically, I, I said, well, I have, to, I have to edit that because it has to be the, my, the playlist I want to listen to of James Brown. So getting to, I mean, that's a little bit, you know, Mel Brooks, it's good to be the king, but having, subjecting my playlist to everyone, I mean, obviously, yes. it's, um, uh, including Papa Don't Take No Mess, which might not have made the cut, but it's probably my, my favorite James song because of the autobiographical, it's a great song. Obviously, Payback is, I mean, I could go, we could just have to spend the rest of this on James. So that was one. And another one, um, was um, with D'Angelo, where um, when I got there, he was on the to be dropped list. Oh, mm. and, well, people, I, there were people in the company who absolutely got it. And there were suits in the company who absolutely didn't get it. And um, I called him and his manager in for a meeting. And they said, are you, are you dropping us? A woman named Carol Cooper, who was his publisher, very gifted woman, um, called me up before, before I even got the gig. She said, yeah, I have a hunch that you're going to be in there. And when you do, you should check this guy out. And I called her immediately and said, oh my God, you know, she, he, he's phenomenal. Yes. Yeah, um, and and they, they said, you're, you're going to drop us? I said, no, I'm going to bet the company on you. I just want to make sure that you're ready because, you know, I'm going to, my career is going to live Fantastic. or die with, with you guys. And it was really hard. It took, it took four months from the first day that um, we went out to radio with Brown Sugar till we got our first ad, no ads for four months. And I learned this watching, I didn't know him at all well, but my hero as a record executive was always Bob Krasnow at Electra. All right. yeah. The diversity of his taste for his fierce competitiveness. And I saw him do that with records, just hold on and, and you have to, <laughs> you have to be ready to torture your promotion people. You have to hold their feet to the fire. You have to say, you know, no excuse is acceptable, but you also have to be able to treat them with love if you're asking them to do a very hard thing. And I said, I will be very upset if I find you prioritizing any record over brown sugar. But if you come back in here week after week and month after month with no ads, um, I will only bless you and say, you know, I'm sure it's hard, you know, I will take the wet towel and put it over your forehead and on the stool in the corner, whatever it takes. But this was not m me just having a fancy, although I did. Every radio guy in, in the world of black music in America, that from the day they got it, that cassette did not leave their car. They loved it. They just said, I can't play it. I, I, it doesn't sound like my state. I can't play it. So it's like, and this was a lesson that you, you know, that, that, that Clive's career teaches, uh, Clive Davis. Um, you have to have some reality to check your fantasy. It's doing everyone a favor to get off of something that isn't going to work. Maybe you'll live to fight another day. The most you'll achieve is just to piss people off and have a, have a bad attitude about the artist. But people love this guy. So we just kept pushing and pushing. And that's when there was a fair amount of corruption involved too. I mean, because that never hurts. And um, I was not above it at all. And, uh, but when it blew, blew up, it, it blew up uh, an, enormously. And it was like a sort of a changing, a changing moment. Because I also knew... As a, as a white guy that loved soul music. There's a kind of soul music that white people love. I love a lot of that music too. Um, but that's different from things which really work in 
in the medium, in the environment. So this seemed like something that wouldn't work, but if you listened to it, you knew that it it could, but the environment would have to change. You'd have to yeah, do yeah. Yep. To soil to get the soil, you know, the pH a little different, and then the plant could flourish in the climate. But but it was it was really good. Um, so know, much of what you were doing was so much, we're going to do this. Yeah. I was going to say, so much of what you were doing was to do with, 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 with having the, the sixth sense to see what was commercial. And there was a time when you were a co-songwriter, weren't you? Worked with, I think, with Gene Simmons and John Entwistle, all sorts of people. How, yeah, did, that, yeah. how did that work? I'm well, fascinated I by that. Signed, I was signed um, as an artist at Almo, which is A&M's publishing company. And, and I mean, a bunch of the songs that I'm going to be, be putting up were song demos, which weren't going to weren't going to work. I mean, I think I sent you guys a, a song... A, a country song I wrote called I Never Should Have Bought These Shoes. Um, and I get it. I mean, I, I, I used to say, look, if I submitted a demo of an R&B tune and it didn't have any bass on it and the lyrics are like, well, maybe I'm like my mother. She's never satisfied. And maybe I'm like my father. <laughs> it's called When Doves Cry. You'd be like, great, good, fine. Go back, write something else, something we can pitch, something we can tell. And you know, <laughs> their perspective that that would be a very hard song to pitch but when you let people who like that music hear it that's when you have to be ready to judge not from what the gatekeeper is saying we live in a much yeah. better world where their gatekeepers aren't empowered anymore really uh -huh. um but you have to take the lesson from from those people so i knew that d'angelo was not a, a white boy's idea of soul music it was on every level, the real thing. And um, um, the songwriting was just, well, we can't really place these songs. I have a demo that I may be putting up, which is a very, I mean, listen, a lot of times when you're writing also, it's just fun, especially if you're like us and you listen to music and it's all very referential. It's a very um, uh, Barry White inspired tune called She's a Remix of You. Um, I mean, you can picture what, you know, what that is. Um, you know, I even got her wearing your perfume, but it's not the same. She's just a remix of you. Um, and um, so they were like, okay, well, this, he does this kind of clever shit. Maybe someone will like it. So they would put me in a situation. So yeah. I was there to like turn, a, you know, a bad any money song into a slightly less bad any money song. I spent a week in Vancouver with Loverboy and wrote, co-wrote five or six songs on that album. Um, that made me half a million bucks. And, um, and um, you know, I used to say it was like doing a crossword puzzle where every clue is girl or car. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And Gene Simmons is a brilliant, very funny guy yeah. who was always trying to fuck with me. And I had all these great sort of grand guignol ideas for things we were going to do. And he taught me the best lesson of marketing I ever learned. Yeah. Said, Look, you're a smart little funny kid but here's the thing i'm ludicrous i know that i'm ludicrous and in every little boy's room in america and in much of the rest of the world there's a poster of me in the platform shoes with my tongue sticking out and every kid every one of those little kids dads says he's horrible he's ridiculous what do you see in this and the minute that i wink and let anyone know that I'm in on the joke, I have just betrayed the little boy because I've sided with dad. And I will never, ever do that. To Very dad. good. We're gonna burst the balloon, yeah. Yeah, and he was absolutely right. And so like we wrote a song, um, or we rewrote a song, I mean, I guess you'd have to say with that process, called Good Girl Gone Bad, that was yeah. on, on Nevison album that definitely went platinum. And we wrote, no, what was the other one? We wrote a few that, that made it to vinyl. Um, and um, uh, there was a verse, I mean, it was so terrible. I think something like um, uh, eyes of a woman, hands of a child. You couldn't say that anymore. Uh, uh, something of an angel driving me wild. And I said, couldn't we just say in the hands of a child, brain of a gerbil driving me wild? He was like, no, there you go again. <laughs> but just, oh, what nicer did that have been to hear brain of a gerbil? <laughs> 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 I was wrong, but 
we had fun. <laughs> that was my that was my songwriter, you know, for hire, and I and I paid my way with uh, bridges or a little melodic fix here or there. Or, yeah. Or the second verse, a lot, or or sometimes I would come in with the idea, but mostly they had the idea. But you know, it's, my feeling was always if you have to put a tambourine on the second verse, you need to rewrite the second verse. <laughs> you can't put a tambourine, but if people are getting bored, then there's something in the grooves that's not quite there. But certainly, you have an opportunity with the lyrics to tell people something they haven't heard before. Yeah. And if you don't have a second verse worth saying, you shouldn't have a second verse. So. Um, yeah, I was there for second verses and bridges and maybe a melodic turn or a, why don't we try this key change there? Oh, yeah. I love stuff like this. <laughs> I was very much a mechanic. Yeah, sort of philosophy learned from writing songs. Start with a chorus, that kind of thing. It's good. But now you're a novelist. Well, yeah, I guess I'm somewhere between a novelist and a, well, I'm a very much a struggling novelist. But I, I, when I left the music business, which was after Island. Uh, I was the chairman of Island briefly before it got sold out from under us, but um, that would have been fun. But, you know, you sort of, I also sort of realized like corporate music business, I can't, I can't look people in the eye and make the kind of commitments that you think you could, which is if I have success and if we keep, you know, maxing out our bonuses, cause we're doing a great job, they'll let me keep doing this. But, other things happen or there's an acquisition and then it changes. So I also thought, look, I need to get back to writing. I want to do other things. If I don't do it now, I, you know, when will I? So I did. So I wrote a book that got um, bid on and published in 2003, I think, called Faithful. Um, and then I wrote two others. I'm working on a fourth that um, because of my own mental mental frailties and illnesses and whatever, I haven't done anything with that I should. The, the second one, um, my publisher hated it because it wasn't, um, uh, I mean, the first book happened to be full of some fairly kinky sex, um, not in a way that I thought was at all pleasant, but um, that was just sort of the story and the characters. Um, when people Was that not, well received by critics? It was very mixed. Uh, but it was not the beach read that people, that the publisher that thought thought it would be. Um, and uh, then the second one didn't have any of that and never was going to or meant to. And they were like, well, what's this about? So yes. you know, I, got, I, got, I got beaten up and I totally under, understood it. And having been in a choir then at that point for a long time, I got the, the thing. But I also didn't. I'm actually working on getting all of that stuff happening now. So we'll, we'll see, but I have two mm. and a, there's a third that I'm working on in a nonfiction thing. So yeah, I like to write, I write songs um, still. Been working on theater stuff with a guy we became friends with because we were neighbors in 1979, Desmond Child. All right. Who, and we've been writing songs ever since of one sort or another, not pop songs, because I'd be a lot richer if I were writing pop songs yes. with him. Um, but trying to write like show tunes. So we've been trying to do shows. And actually one of the songs we wrote, he produced a song for uh, Streisand on her last album. And somehow she heard this other song. And so she's been raving about that. She's recording the song of ours on her next. Wonderful. Album. That's fantastic. And now they've asked us for a second one, which I hope they'll like. So we'll see. But this other one, if she makes another record, and I think she will. Um, she's definitely doing that one because she did, like can't stop talking about it, which is lovely. I mean, if only my mom were alive to see it. Yeah. Did you get some records out that you were going to... And fan. Yeah. You were, did you have some records that you were going to uh, talk about? Sure. You, I you have got, a, what have you got there? Well, I have a lot of records that I could talk about. The physical show and tell, because I don't care briefly, we've done uh, this. I just yeah. pulled things out... Um, you wanted to know about the greatest records? Yeah, go on. Yes. Pick, pick, pick your greatest record. Greatest yeah. record. Go on. It's, again, it's really hard. And as I as I said to you before, I view it more as an essay prompt than an actual question deserving of an answer. Because we all, but but Sly and the Family Stone, there's a riot going on. Right. Uh, and and the Stones' Exile on Main Street would would be two at the very very top. Maybe 
I mean, so many Miles Davis records, it's hard to pick, but I would say Jack Johnson, weirdly enough, because yes. um, it's so it's so bluesy and I'm and it was in that great Tio Macero period. Um, I'm looking at my notes now because I was thinking about this um, side one of low. Uh, Bowie. Um, a wonderful record. It's like the. Well, I can't even begin to talk about it because I've never stopped so much Dylan. But I would say probably if I had to like for me. And a lot of it's just the age you, you come to it. I would say 61 and Blonde on Blonde, maybe even more Blonde on Blonde because it was so romantic. And there, there is a picture of the girl on the inside of the gatefold, and it's like, I want to marry her. <laughs> Isn't, wasn't that Claudia Cardinale? I think it was. And, and didn't they take it off? Marry her. What? Didn't they take it off? Because they, they didn't have permission. Is that right? Well, I'm I not dreaming. So. I, I, I mean, I bought it, you know, the day it came out. Well, yes, yes. But I, so, so I would have had it before they, before they, they, yeah. they it but I'm not mentioning anything by Lucio Dalla, who's a complete hero of mine, the Italian singer songwriter. Um, and in terms, I mean, Gary Stewart, like one of the greatest insane country and Western singers of all times, who was like, you could hear, the amphetamine in his in his vibrato, mm. and all the songs were about the same thing, uh, with titles like "She's Acting Single, I'm Drinking Doubles." <laughs> <laughs> in the bar with her, and he knows he's gonna she's gonna go off with someone else because he actually can't get it up anymore. Uh, but he's just, why do I take the torture of this? There's a song; it's their anniversary. I called ten years of this. Um, so Gary Stewart, but I mean, so many songs. I'm not even going to read my list because I could go on and I mean, I haven't even got, there's so much reggae stuff. Right. Uh, I looked at the single of Junior Biles, Curly Locks the other day. What a great song that was. Um, Sugar My Not, Oh, Mr. DC. I mean, just so many right. and obviously super well-known things, but I'll hold up. Um, this is a great album. Michael Henderson, solid. I mean, what a cover. Oh, I don't, I really know, don't know that. Tell us what about a him. Suit. So Michael Henderson was um, the bass player. He was like 19 or 20 in Miles' band in the period of like oh. Get Up With It and Jack Johnson. Oh, right. okay. All right. A spectacular bass player and ended up writing uh, a bunch of songs like You Are My Starship that Norman Connors had a big hit with. And he actually sang on that. Um, uh and still, I think, works. I mean, went to see, he, he had a big period, a couple of gold albums. This was his first album. And it's sort of a mixture of songs which just sound like great Miles Davis from the period, but with actual melodies and lyrics in a groove where there's some instrumentals. But if you could, that's a phenomenal album. I just was like reaching in and pulling and thought, well, I don't need to play on anything people have seen before. Oh, here. So no, that's really good. I've not heard of it. Favorite Bill Withers Bill album. Bill Withers. Yeah. Justin. Yeah. Um, much forgotten, but um, yeah. uh, it, I mean, it has songs on it like Ruby Lee, yeah. which is an amazing bass line and an amazing song, um, uh, Heartbreak Road. I mean, this is a great, if, 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 if you feel like I wish there were more Bill Withers, I mean, a lot of them have been put on compilations, but a lot of it hasn't. So that's a great one. Yeah. Um, so much Marvin, couldn't really pick Marvin, but here, my dear. Right. It's a phenomenal record. And uh, he, he did it, and it's a double album to celebrate, his, to, celebrate to, to fulfill his uh, recording commitment to Barry Gordy when he was divorcing Barry Gordy's sister, Anna. And the whole record, I mean, it's such a fascinating story, is basically a damnation of Anna um, and meant to torture her also, like reminding her when it was so fine um, before it all went south. So Barry Gordy had the odd challenge, do I promote it to make money off of my last two discs <laughs> and, and like calumnize my sister or not? So he didn't. <laughs> and I, I can remember who, but I won't say, gave it a one-star review in Melody Maker. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a second. So I came out the next week and I don't think they'd ever done this before or after with a five-star review. Right. of it saying please disregard my colleagues um, <laughs> this is, and it is remains just a phenomenal phenomenal record songs like when did you stop loving me when did i stop loving you 
I mean, a lot of it is kind of almost stream of consciousness. I mean, his ad lib at the end of, I think maybe that song is, why do I have to pay attorney fees, attorney fees, you know, in that Marvin way, but it's so from the heart and so wise. And just the last one I'll show, because he's also like my total hero, uh, Hoagie Carmichael. Oh, right. oh lovely, yeah. Um, who was much influenced by his friend, Bix Biederbeck, I guess, in his phrasing. And his music is just very strange. For someone who had all these huge hits, obviously Stardust, uh, probably best known, um, uh, but so many, Moon Country, um, Georgia On My Mind, uh, but many other great, great, great songs. And they're odd, and they're, 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 they're not of their time. He was an amazing singer. Um, go pull up the clip of him singing Hong Kong Blues, which was the song that I always sung my children to sleep with. That's something to do with my rendition, I'm sure. Um, which was from the movie of To Have and Have Not with Humphrey Bogart and uh, Lauren Bacall when they met when they were 18. You can find that clip on YouTube of him as the piano player doing Hong Kong blues. Um, just a great, often didn't write the lyrics, but often did. Uh, um, so, I mean, if I'm thinking of who's like also like a major inspiration and influence, I'd have to say Hoagie big time. Also, the person that Ian Fleming yes. said that said that James Bond looked like. Right, because he was kind of lanky and thin and not classically handsome. But, yeah. Um, uh, so, so, if you're looking for a new James Bond, start well, with Hoagie Carmichael. Yeah, dig him up. That's right. Dig him out. <laughs> and, he's, and he's your man. Yeah. That Very good. It, it's been fantastic talking to you. That was fun. Um, about Brilliant. Su such a range of stuff. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.